I want to ask you guys a question. What comes to mind when you hear this word? Christmas. What comes to mind when you hear Christmas? I think a lot of things come to mind. Maybe for you, some that comes to mind is Santa Claus. Isn't that awesome? Santa wearing a mask. It's, he's even a... Did you hear that Fauci came out this week and said everything's cool, Santa's clean, he doesn't have COVID, it's all good. So, or maybe, so maybe Santa comes, comes to mind. Maybe, maybe this comes to mind. Um, maybe family. Christmas is a time for family. You get together with family. Maybe that's what you think of this time of year. Or maybe you think of this. Stress, right? Like this is just a time of stress. Some of you, like, like you're already like at your breaking point. Right? And your family hasn't even showed up yet. You know, you're just stressed. That's what you think of when you think about Christmas. Or what what about this? What if you think of um, presents? Right? I mean, of course we think of presents at Christmas, especially if you're a kid, right? And if you're a parent whose your kid has forgotten you, you think of presents because you've been forgotten, right? Especially if you have have teenagers. Or maybe, what if you think of um, the tree and, you know, Frosty and all the kind of Christmas specials that come around and all the decorations that go along with Christmas. Or maybe for you, you think of baby Jesus, right? That's what you think of when you think of Christmas. Well, I was thinking about all of that this week, and, and I started wondering something. And maybe you've wondered this at one time or another, but, you know, I wonder what comes to God's mind when he thinks of Christmas. You ever wonder that? Like, what comes to God's mind when he thinks about Christmas? Well, I really think that when God thinks about Christmas, he thinks about how far he went to have a relationship with you and me. He thinks about how far he went to step out of heaven where things were good and become a, a, create, a created being to become a human being so that you and I might know him, so that you and I might be able to have a relationship with him. I think that's what God thinks about when he thinks about Christmas. And as we're going to see this morning, that is exactly what the Apostle John is trying to say to us through the other Christmas story. See, um, for the past few weeks, we've been looking at the other Christmas story, the one that's found in the Gospel of John. And, and there's no manger in the other Christmas story. There are no shepherds. There's no angels. There's no Mary. There's no Joseph. There's not even baby Jesus in the other Christmas story. In fact, the other Christmas story has a different agenda altogether. And that agenda is John wants us to know right up front who Jesus is. He wants us to know without a doubt who Jesus is. And we may not agree with what John says. We may not believe what John says. But John is perfectly clear about what he believes and about who he thinks Jesus is. And it's found in John chapter 1. We're we're looking at verses 1 through 14. It's kind of the prologue of John's gospel. If you have your Bible, you can open up there. It's on the Bible app. On the YouVersion Bible app, you can pull it up on your phone. We're going to put these verses up on the screen. But so far... We have been looking at verses 1 through 8, and I'm going to read those to us so that they can kind of, we can refresh our mind about what what we talked about so far. It says this, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning the light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. Now that's what we, where we've been so far. That's kind of what we, what we talked about so far. We've looked at how Jesus was the word, how he was and is God, how he is the creator of everything, that everything that has been made was made through him. We talked about how Jesus is the true life and that real life and true life only comes through Jesus, that you cannot have life apart from Jesus. Last week we were introduced to a man who came to introduce Jesus. We call him John the Baptist and we saw that he was sent from God to be a witness of the light, to be the one that points people to the light, just like we're supposed to point people to the light. John the Baptist came to do that, to to point us to Jesus. Well, now, the last part in this trilogy of John's prologue, he kind of shifts his focus back to 
pointing us in the direction of Jesus, to emphasizing who Jesus is. And I'm going to read all the verses, and then we'll come back and kind of break them apart. Look at what John says about Jesus. He says, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Well, there's so much in these verses. Let's kind of go back to verse 9 and kind of pick it apart. I hope that you take some notes, you write some stuff down, because it's not just me who wants you to know who Jesus is and what God is like as we see in Jesus. It's John, who was one of Jesus' best friends, one of the guys who spent three years walking around with Jesus. He's like, look, guys, I want to introduce you to my best friend. I want you to know who he is without a shadow of a doubt. And so let's look at verse 9 and what he says. He says, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. This is John's way of saying, look, Jesus didn't come for a select few. He came for everyone. He came to bring salvation to all of us. This is his way of saying that salvation is available to all of us. But then he says something a little bit kind of sad. Verse 10 He says that he was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. Though he was in the world, the world did not recognize, or the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. That even though Jesus was in the world, and even though that Jesus created the world, remember John had already made that very clear, that anything that was created was created through Jesus, that the world did not recognize Jesus. The word recognize could also be translated as know, and it implies this intimate knowledge that the world did not know the one who had created him. I feel like this is one of the saddest verses in the entire Bible, because what it tells us is that the creation did not recognize its creator. But then he goes on in verse 11 and says this, this is also sad, it says he came to that which was his own but his own did not receive him. Now, before we talk about how sad this is, I got to point out something really, really cool grammatically. I know that all of you are fascinated with cool grammar, right? You know, you're just, you just love cool grammar. You just can't wait to talk about cool grammar. Well, John does something really cool in this verse grammatically. And this word that's translated own twice in the English language is actually two Greek words. And the first one refers to God's own creation, So basically, he says he came to his own creation. But the second own doesn't refer to his own creation. The second own refers to his own people, the Jewish people. In other words, it says that his his own he came to his own chosen people, and those chosen people did not receive him. So let that sink in for a minute. That Jesus came to his own creation, and he came to his own people, and they rejected him. They didn't accept who he was. Now, Now, why would this be? Why would his own people, why would his own creation not accept him? Why would they reject him? Well, I think it's because Jesus just didn't live up to their expectations. He didn't meet their expectations. You know what they were expecting? They were expecting a conquering hero. And here Jesus shows up as a baby born in a, and laid in a, in a manger. Uh, They were expecting someone who came as a conquering hero. They weren't expecting a suffering servant. They were expecting the Lion of Judah. But the one who showed up was the Lamb of God, who came to die to take away the sins of the world. See, Jesus wasn't what they were expecting. And because of that, they didn't accept him. And the truth is, I think that's why a lot of people don't accept Jesus today. Maybe that's why some of you don't accept Jesus today. Because he doesn't live up to your expectations. Like Jesus isn't who you want him to be. You prayed for something one time and he didn't answer the way you wanted him to answer and so he didn't meet your expectations so you're out. Or maybe Jesus, you look around and you see all the pain and suffering in the world and you're like, why isn't God doing something about this? Jesus isn't living up to your expectations so because of that, you're not gonna receive him. You're not gonna accept him. See, just like back then, It's the same today that Jesus doesn't live up to our expectations a lot of times. And so we end up being just like them. But like I said about verse 10, verse 11, 
It's so, so sad to me. But I think it was heartbreaking for Jesus that he would come to his own and for his own to reject him. Now, it would be pretty tragic if John just stopped there, but he doesn't. He says something really cool next. Look at verse 12. He says that, Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. In other words, there were a group of people who didn't reject Jesus. There were a group of people who did accept Jesus, who did receive him. And that really refers to all of us who've made a decision to follow Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And, and like I said last week, that word believed is very, very important. It doesn't just mean an emotional experience or a cognitive ascent. No, it means trust and faith and dependence. See, belief is more than just, oh, I I think the sky's blue. No, belief is this trust and dependence on who Jesus is and what he's done for us. and, And so he says that those who believe, he gave the right to become children of God. That's a legal phrase, that last term there, that means that we've been legally adopted into God's family. We were without a family, but now we've been legally adopted into God's family. This, that, that's my favorite metaphor for what it means to be in a right relationship with God, by the way, to be in the family of God, that we were once not in the family of God. We were God's creation, but we weren't his children. But because of what Jesus has done for us, we now have been adopted legally into the family of God. Of God, I just think that's really, really cool. And it's not our doing, it's all God's doing, which is what he says next in verse 13. He says, children born not of natural descent, nor human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. I know those of you in the parents that are parents in the room, some of you became parents because you planned it right? You like plan things out. We're going to have a kid here. We're going to wait two and a half years and we're going to have another kid, you know. Others of you became a parent because it was a surprise, you know. Oops. Uh, or, yeah, no, it's, you would never say that, right? But, you know, it's just you weren't planning it. It's just a surprise. But this kind of becoming a child of God wasn't by any human planning or decision and it wasn't by accident. It was something that God did. That God made this decision. That God was the one who did it all. That he's the one who um, made us children of God. God made a way for us to have a relationship with him. God made a way for us to be adopted into the family of God, and that is through Jesus, which is kind of where John circles back to and wraps up his prologue. Look at verse 14. First part says, For the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. If you want to know where the birth story of Jesus is in John's gospel, this is it. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. That's John's way of saying that God became one of us. God became a human. The creator became one of his creation. And he did it not as a conquering hero, but he came as an infant. I love the message version of this, which says it this way. It says, God became skin and blood and moved into our neighborhood. God became skin and blood and moved into our neighborhood. There's a fancy big church word for this. You probably know, I've heard it before. It's the word incarnation. This is the incarnation that God became a human being. Now just think about that for just a minute. That's what we celebrate at Christmas, right? That, that, that God became a human being. But think about how that speaks to the value of those of us who are humans. This, this speaks enormously about our uniqueness and our value as human beings that God would become one of us He didn't become any other animal. He became a human. And this is kind of a side note, but it makes me think that if God values us that much, maybe we should value other people in the same way that he values us. But that's a whole other sermon. But um, it says that the word became flesh. And then it says it made his dwelling among us. That means that he took up residence with us. He made his home among us. And, And this residence that he took up with us wasn't a temporary residence. No, it's a permanent residence. That's what that phrase is talking about when it says he made his dwelling among us. It wasn't something that was temporary. It was permanent. And that is that God is permanently among us in the person of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said that at the end of Matthew's gospel where he said, I will be with you always, even to the ends of the age. He has set up permanent residence with us. So it goes on. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father 
full of grace and truth. Let me kind of unpack that because it's a little bit confusing. Because remember, John's talking in poetic language. But when he says we've seen his glory, what he's talking about is we've, we've seen who he really is. And what he's really like. And let me just tell you, John wants us to know that what he's really like is a perfect picture of what God is like. You want to see a picture of God? You look at Jesus because the invisible God became visible in the person of Jesus. And then that phrase, one and only, it means that Jesus is the unique son of God. Let that sink in for a minute. That Jesus is unique, that there is none like him, that there are no other sons of God, that there are no other divine humans, there's no other God-man. Jesus is the one and the only unique son of God who came from the Father. And then he wraps it up by, wraps it up by kind of talking about Jesus' character, that he is full of grace and truth. Full of grace and truth. Now, I, I love the word and here because it doesn't say that Jesus is full of grace or truth because that's our problem, right? Some of us are all grace. Like, we're really good at grace. We're really good at extending grace. Others of us, man, we're all truth. And grace, we're, we're not all that good at, right? We're, we're more truth than grace. But Jesus is full of all grace and all truth. And the reason why that's important is because he's a perfect picture of what God is like. And if you want to know what God is like, he is full of all grace and he is full of all truth. See, some of us, we think that God's just out to get us, right? That he's ready to zap us. We do something wrong. And you know what? He is full of all truth, but he's also full of all grace. So others of us, we think that, man, man, God just really doesn't care, you know, everybody's going to get in one way and we think he's just all grace. But no, remember, he's all grace and all truth. Jesus is this picture of who God is. He's all grace and all truth. Well, those verses there, that is the other Christmas story. That's the other Christmas story. And the other Christmas story is all about who Jesus is. And just as a reminder, Jesus is God, he's the creator, he's one with the Father, he's the visible image of the invisible God, like Father, like Son. When you see Jesus, you see the Father. He's God and man at the same time, and I know that our little bitty brains have trouble understanding that, right? Some of us, we're pretty smart, but we're not smart enough to kind of comprehend this whole idea that God was God and man at the same time, but that's exactly what Jesus was. He was God and man, but the reason why he was God and man is because he wants all of humanity to know him personally. The reason Jesus became a person was so that we could know him. So that we could have a relationship with God. And so let me ask you, how's your relationship with God? If that's really what Christmas is all about, if Christmas is really all about us being able to have a relationship with our creator, how's your relationship with God doing? Maybe you don't even have one. Um, maybe you could ask it this way. This goes on our to-do list, but... Who is Jesus to you? Who is Jesus to you? I know for a lot of people, like, Jesus asked this to his disciples one day. He's like, who do people say that I am? Remember that story? Some say, oh, some say you're John the Baptist, come back from the dead. Some say you're Isaiah. Some say you're one of the prophets. You know, that's what people are talking about you. What about you? Who do you say Jesus is? Peter raises his hand and goes, I know, I know who you are. You know? You're the son of God. That's who you are, Jesus. You're the Messiah, the chosen one. That is who you are. That's exactly what John was trying to get across in this prologue, in this other Christmas story. So who is Jesus to you? I hope that this week you'll kind of answer that. That's where we started the series. That's where we got to end the series because that was John's point he wants us to know who Jesus is and my assignment for you is not only to answer that but to continue to work to memorize these verses I recognize that the last five verses are harder to memorize than the first eight at least they are for me and uh, but um, I think you can do it you're smarter than you think you are no matter what your teenagers say about you uh, so um, I, I want to encourage you to, to, mem to memorize these few verses um, that, that are on there but to kind of wrap up our time, I want to invite all of you to bow your heads for just a minute. I want you to bow your heads. And, and 
in light of this question that I'm asking you to ask yourself, who is Jesus to you? I just want to say something to those of you who may not know Jesus. Jesus didn't have to become a human, but he did because he wants to have a relationship with you. And if you're interested in knowing Jesus and you don't know him, I want to invite you to pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, I acknowledge that you're the son of God who came to save me from my sin. I'm a sinner in need of a savior. I put my faith in you. I trust you for my salvation. I commit to follow you with my life. For those of you that already do know God, I invite you to pray this prayer. Jesus, I believe that you're the son of God. You're the creator. You're the light of the world. You're the lamb of God who's come to take away the sins of the world. I acknowledge who you are. And I want my life to be a witness for you. Why don't you just take a minute and just focus on who Jesus is. God, I just want to thank you for this other Christmas story. And I love the birth story of Jesus. I love the how the angel showed up to Joseph and to Mary and kind of announced the birth of Jesus. I love how the angels went to the shepherds and then the shepherds went to check out the baby and then they spread the news even though their social status was um, as low as you could get. I, I just, I love that part of the Christmas story, but I, I love this one more because it reminds us of who you are. That Jesus, you are God. And that you are the creator. And that you are the light of the world. And that you are for all of us. And that you became flesh and blood and moved into our neighborhood. And for that, I'm just grateful. You did all of that so that we could know you. And I thank you for the possibility of knowing you. And I want to pray for us as a church family. First, I pray for those of us that already have a relationship with you. That you would help us to not miss out on the, what Christmas is all about this year, that you would help us to be disciplined to focus on who you are and that that would shine through everything that we do, whether we're driving on the road or we're at work or at the grocery store or we're at the mall or hanging out with family, that, that, that you in us would shine through us. And Lord, I want to pray for anybody who's listening to this who does not have a relationship with you, that you would convince them that you are real, that true life is found in you, and that you would lead them to a place of repentance and turning to you so that they can be adopted into your family. Thank you for the opportunity to be a part of your family. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I just want to say that if you, um, if you did pray the first prayer, that you have been legally adopted into the family of God. And there's something to celebrate. And that's just the first step. Second step is baptism. I know some of you have kind of, been, kind of been struggling and thinking about baptism for a while. And last week we got to celebrate as Ellie got, was baptized. And, um, and if, you, if you want to talk to me about that, I would love to chat with you about that as well. We're going to give you another opportunity to respond also by taking communion together so if you want to pull out your little communion cup if you're in the room if you're at home I hope you have something you can use for communion as well because really the reason why Jesus came wasn't just to live a human life so we could all look at and go oh that's what God's like but he also came to die so that our sins could be paid for and that's what we remember every time we take communion together. We take the bread, which represents his body that was broken for us. And we take the juice, which reminds us of the fact that his blood was shed for, our, uh, for, for us so that our sins could be forgiven. And so I invite you guys just to pause. And maybe, maybe even today, 
that you would pause with your eyes closed so that you can focus on what Jesus has done for you and take communion. Let's do that. Heavenly Father, silence is, is really good for our souls. And we just want to pause in that time of silence that we just had just to remember who you are and what you've done for us. And we're so thankful. We're not worthy, but um, you have been gracious to us. Thank you for that grace. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.